Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session monitoring Kafka without instrumentation using VPF. If you are using Kafka or operati operating uh, Kafka, this session should be quite interesting for you. We're going to show a different um, complementary way to monitor Kafka. If you are interested in eBPF, uh, we are going to show what is possible to do with eBPF and in special uh, in a real use case uh, based in protocol tracing, uh, which is a new capability of uh, some of the open source projects we are going to show. My name is Anton Rodriguez. I work um, as a principal software engineer at New Relic. Um, New Relic provides observ observability as, as a service. We are basically a monitoring company. Um, because of that, uh, we are very heavy users of Kafka. We have almost all our services use Kafka. If Kafka is something new for you, allow me to do a very short introduction. It's a distributed system to store information in a temporary way. It's uh, really performant ingesting data. Indeed, the name is because a famous writer, uh, Kafka, um, because Kafka is excellent in writing. When to use uh, Kafka, uh, for example, if there is an application producing a lot of data, instead of sending directly to other application, we store it in Kafka so it can be consumed uh, independent, independently. If there is a problem in the producer or in other applications consuming the same data, it shouldn't affect uh, the rest of our applications. We are decoupling them with Kafka, and that's uh, really good for uh, distributed architectures and event driving architectures. This is also a very important use case for monitoring data, and that's the reason uh, why we are heavy users of Kafka. Just to give you uh, some numbers, we ingest around 125 petabytes of data per month, and it's growing every day. More than 3 billion of data points per minute. Our biggest, biggest Kafka cluster has around 275 machines, uh, brokers in Kafka term terminology, and an average traffic of 20 gigabytes per second. And that's just only the traffic through Kafka, but there is also the internal traffic, so it's much more than that. Being completely honest, operate something so big was quite painful. Uh, we have the feeling we were pushing the technology to the limit with uh, so, uh, so big cluster. So we split the cluster in the smaller ones as part of our cloud job. One of the good things of working in a company providing monitoring is that we can monitor everything we want and we don't have to pay for it. It's basically free because it's the service we provide to our customers. But even with that, and our experience running Kafka to scale, uh, we find Monitor Kafka pretty challenging. And there are re several reasons for that. Uh, Ryan, next slide, please. The first one is because we need information from different places. We need metrics from the operative system, things like the CPU, the memory, that are extremely important, but even more important for us, for Kafka operators, is the network throughput and the disk annual latency. They are the typical bottlenecks working with Kafka. We need also metrics from the Java virtual machine, uh, for example, to know when and for how long garbage collector has been running. In a system processing data in near real time, the Java garbage collector may introduce latency and delays in our applications. And finally, um, probably more, even more important, we need Kafka metrics. Kafka exposes them using GMX, so we use something called the GMX exporter, the project with our Kafka services. It exposes an endpoint, so we can have the metrics in Prometheus, and from them, export them to an observability platform, so we can create dashboards, alerts, uh, to see what is happening and all that stuff, the Grafana, New Relic, uh, Datadog, there are many of them. As you can see, uh, we need to operate di different pieces and to know exactly what metrics we need and how to interpret, it, uh, interpret them uh, to operate Kafka. If there are new metrics, we have to add them and do some changes, and that's a lot of work. Um, even doing that is not enough. Uh, next slide, please. One of the particularities of Kafka 
is how to rely on the clients. Both Kafka brokers and clients work together to achieve uh, a better performance. And that's one of the key uh, components of Kafka, of the reasons why Kafka is so good. It works really well, but it also makes monitoring Kafka much more complicated. Big organizations, as our case, have thousands of different clients created by different teams, and they typically use different technologies and frameworks. In our case, most of the teams use Java, but there are also Python, Kotlin, and Go. And when there are problems, we need to know what's happening also in the client side. And for that, the only way is to instrument those clients. That requires a lot of standardization and governance, which leads to frustration. Never tell a data science they can use Python. They're going to hate you. Also, the Kafka platform team has to validate clients and their use cases, but it's really hard to automate all that stuff. A good example of this is how to know the versions of the clients using Kafka. It's important to know them when we are upgrading our clusters. In general, Kafka provides very good backward compatibility. Uh, but yet, we had problems in the past because we have some clients running very old versions and they were impacting we when uh, we grabbed to a newer version of the cluster. And we are not alone on that. Uh, so someone contributed a, a feature in Kafka to allow the clients to report their versions. Unfortunately, all clients and some frameworks don't provide that information in uh, any way. So we don't have a good picture of what our clients are using and that makes our life harder. There is a Kafka improvement uh, proposal, a keep, uh, to send all the client metrics to Kafka and make them available with open telemetry. But it isn't ready yet. It goes against one of the fundamental design principles of Kafka, which is uh, basically uh, keep the broker light and simple so it can be easily evolved and, and performant. We we'll see what happens if it is merged to Kafka, but right now it's not ready yet. Next slide, Ryan, please. A great example of why monitoring clients is important are consumer rebalances. Uh, we have here a producer uh, sending data to a Kafka topic. A topic is basically a logical grouping of information, like a database table, uh, but in Kafka terminology. Topics are divided into partitions, so they can be distributed in several machines, what we call brokers. And this is how Kafka provides higher ability and it can scale. Now, we have here an application deployed in Kubernetes uh, with two pods, or as we say in Kafka terminology, uh, two consumer instances, consumer instance one and consumer instance two. And this is important, we can have uh, more than one instance reading for one partition. Basically, a uh, partition is the unit of parallels in Kafka. We, ha we can have a consumer instance reading multiple partitions, but not uh, in, in inverse. Now, uh, if we launch a new pod, uh, so we have now three different instances uh, on the right, in this case, consumer instance three, Kafka will detect the new situation and it will assign one partition to each instance to make everything more efficient and split the total form to balance all the traffic to the, all the customer instances. But in order to do that, it will do a rebalance. It will stop the consumers to negotiate and tell them what partition should consume. And that's exactly a rebalance. The problem with it is they have to stop the consumers and that introduces latency, and latency in general is a huge problem for our clients. Problems in rebalances are usual and hard to debug because we need to know what's causing the rebalance. And there are several factors like various new consumers or starts or problems in the network, many things. So it requires metrics from the consumer instances and the brokers really understand uh, what's happening and how to solve. Next slide, Ryan. Thank you. There is one metric uh, we didn't mention yet, and it's fundamental, consumer lag. Consumer lag tells us how much data is spending or being consumed uh, by a particular organization. 
if there is no difference between the last producer's uh, data and the last consumer data, um, as you can see in the first row of the diagram, uh, we are good. That means there is no consumer lag. But if there is a difference, as we can see in the second row, there is consumer lag. This can happen for different reasons. There may be problems in the consumer, it may be too slow, problems in the broker, maybe there is not enough uh, network bandwidth or disk I.O. Or even it's a problem in the producer. It may be producing more data than we were expecting. In any case, uh, consumer lag is an excellent indicator, indicator uh, to know if there are problems. And it's the main metric uh, we use for alert. Most of our incidents start with uh, consumer lag. That's also a problem because it's hard to know initially what thing should be paid. Maybe a consumer, maybe the, the Kafka platform team, maybe the producer. And again, we need an external component to help this metric. There are some good open source projects uh, like uh, Burrow from LinkedIn or the Kafka Lag Exporter for Lime. Uh, the benefit of the Kafka Lag uh, Exporter is, report, is that um, it's able to report consumer lag also in seconds. And that's much more useful than the number of messages. Consumer lag in seconds uh, gives an idea of the latency introduced by the pro um, by the problem and how long it will take uh, back to a normal situation. Uh, it gives us uh, um, the measure of the latency, and that's very important. So, okay, those are the challenges of monitor Kafka. I think they're pretty clear. Uh, next slide. So, how EBPF can help us uh, with those challenges? First of all, in case it's new for you, let me introduce uh, it here. It's a new feature of the Linux kernel. It allows us uh, to tell uh, the, uh, to the kernel uh, to notify when IBPF probe uh, when something happened. It's like a breakpoint in a debug. It also interrupts execution when a breakpoint is reached, but unlikely a uh, breakpoint, a small program is run. It, in, it expands and collects any relevant state and then immediately resumes the security. One of the benefits uh, compared with other ways to obtain the same data is that it's safer. We don't want to break things in the kernel. Um, programs, so they don't interfere or create any problem or security risk. The other benefit is the overhead is really low. So we can track a lot of things and we are stealing resources from the programs running on our server. It's in the case of Kafka, it's uh, the main priority. It is the main priority. How do we create a VPF program? First of all, we use the C programming language, we compile it to bytecode, and we send it to the kernel. We specify when that program should be executed. And the kernel is going to validate all that. And if there is a problem or a potential uh, risk or uh, security, it's going to reject it. Those programs uh, have very strong limitations uh, just to make sure they're safe. One is ready uh, and when the specific condition happen, a network packet arrives, or a new connection is open, or a program opens a file, or whatever is happening in the kernel will be selected. The kernel will execute the program in a very efficient way. Um, uh, typically, the program will return data to the user space uh, when we have a lot more freedom to do whatever we want. So we can show the data to the user or we can send it to an external system or uh, whatever we want. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have some examples uh, built with uh, BCC. Uh, BCC is a toolkit which uh, provides helpers and other useful components to build eBPF programs. Uh, we can do things like track uh, the disk I.O. latency, which could be very useful for Kafka. Uh, we can list the process uh, running both in the kernel and the user space. Uh, we can list the, the, uh, the TCP connections open, or we can uh, define uh, whatever other trace we are, have interest on. 
Uh, BCC also provides uh, front end for Lua and Python, uh, but in general, we need to know how to code in C and a bit of the Linux kernels internals uh, to be able to build programs, programs with it. It's interesting, uh, very powerful, but most of us probably don't want to do this. Uh, we just want to monitor our services, and this could be overwhelming. Next, uh, next slide, Ryan. An issue, uh, a, much, a more popular alternative is to use a BPF, BPF trace. It's a very popular command line. Uh, basically, it's a, we can define with a domain specific language, a DSL, what we want to monitor, and BPF trace will show it for us. And as you can see, it's very powerful. Um, with just uh, one liners, we can see things like the files opened by a process, the number of syscalls uh, done by a program, the number of byte read, and many, many other things. And um, we can even execute it in Kubernetes with a Q control trace uh, to obtain information from our pods, which is very handy. Uh, but yet to, to do this, uh, or to modify these things, you need to know, uh, have knowledge about uh, what you want to monitor and uh, the ability to be able to translate it to the DSL. And it's also something you're going to run in the command line, so to analyze data is not so easy. And next slide, please. So um, another option maybe easier to use is EBPF exporter. This is a building top of the VCC. And it was open source by Profer. It allows us to export metrics to Prometheus, so then we can put them with Grafana or any other monitoring tool. And it's more simpler, it's much simpler than other tools and yet very powerful. But if you, go, you want to use this in the context of something like Kafka, then you need to modify it and you need to uh, understand how to retrieve those metrics, and that's not easy at all. So now let me introduce uh, Pixie, uh, Cloud Native Cloud Computing Foundation project. Uh, we make uh, to work with EBPF even easier. Uh, next slide, Ryan. Um, just to introduce Pixie, I want to say hello to my colleague Ryan. Uh, he's a Pixie committer who's going to show us Pixie in action with a very cool uh, demo, and especially specifically for the context of Kafka. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Anton. I'm Ryan. I'm a software engineer at Pixie Labs and Neuralic, and I work on the Kafka tracing capabilities at Pixie. So what is Pixie? Pixie is an open source CNCF observability platform targeted at Kubernetes applications. And Pixie collects all the data with auto instrumentation from eBPF. So Pixie's vision is to help developers understand what's happening in their Kubernetes cluster when something goes wrong in their clusters with all the microservices, it's often very difficult to debug. Pixie provides a set of tools for developers to figure out what's going on in their clusters when there is a performance or functional issue. One of the most important features of Pixie is to provide network traffic tracing. When there are different services interconnected in a cluster, we want to know what services are talking to each other, when they are talking, and what data they are sending. Pixie started with tracing HTTP traffic and expanded into other protocols like gRPC HTTP2, database protocols like MySQL, Postgres, and Redis, and event streaming protocols like Kafka. And there's one key requirement we had in our mind when building Pixie. From the user's perspective, there should be no instrumentation. Pixie handles all the instrumentation required automatically with eBPF. That means for users, there's no code modification, no recompiling, and no redeployment of your application. You simply turn Pixie on and it automatically collects the data on your running cluster. This makes debugging, for example, uh, large scale Kafka systems in production much easier because code modification and redeployment can be very inconvenient and costly. And tracing with eBPF also has low overhead and allows Pixie to always stay active. So I will also like to give an overview of Pixie's approach to protocol tracing. Basically, there's a pod called the Pixie Edge module, or PEM, deployed on every node of your Kubernetes cluster. On each node, the Pixie Edge module captures the network traffic of all the other pods with eBPF K-probes in the kernel space. 
Every time a network-related syscall happens, such as send and receive syscalls, the k-probes get triggered and capture the data and the metadata of that connection. The traffic is then classified uh, into specific protocols such as HTTP or Kafka and shipped into user space. In user space, the protocol parser sorts, understands, and parses the data into more structured messages. These messages are then stored into tables for querying in the future. And a user is able to come online, browsing the UI, and query the data with Pixie's querying language, which we call Pixel Scripts. The queries are sent to a powerful query engine, which retrieves the requested data from the data tables. And this is basically a high-level overview of how Pixie uses eBPF um, to trace network traffic. But you might still be wondering, so how exactly is this data traced? Um, basically, you could think about Pixie as very similar to Wireshark, which snoops all the network traffic happening on the host. Um, the difference is that Pixie traces the standard Linux syscalls much closer to the application, whereas Wireshark traces at the data link layer. And by tracing the Linux syscalls, we're able to skip over the complexities of parsing IP TCP packets and achieve low overhead. And this also allows us um, to trace at the standard interface, which means that tracing will work regardless of the target application. In Kafka, this means that it doesn't matter what components are connected to your Kafka brokers or what clients are used, uh, whether it's Python or Java or Go, as long as they use the Kafka wire protocol, Pixie will be able to trace it. And for example, in this diagram, we see that uh, the Kafka broker is sending send and receive syscalls back and forth uh, to the Linux API. Um, and all that information is being captured with eBPF. Uh, and sent to user space, where a protocol parser processes it uh, into the raw data into fetch and produce messages for Kafka data events and join group sync group messages for consumer rebalancing events. These messages are stored in the table store for querying later. So with that being said, I would like to move on uh, to a very simple demo scenario where we'll see how Pixie works uh, uh, in reality to debug a uh, live Kafka cluster. So in this example, we'll have a very simple kind of an e-commerce site uh, with one topic in a Kafka cluster, the order topic, with one producer, the order service, producing to the order topic uh, every second or so. And we have two consumers, a shipping service and the invoicing service, both um, consuming from the order topic. The difference between these two services is that the shipping service is normal and able to keep up with the load. Um, the orders are produced. However, the invoicing service is uh, very slow and is actually unable to keep up the load. And we'll see how Pixie is able to discover this issue and provide us information about uh, the producer consumer, the consumer producer latency, uh, et cetera. And so I've already deployed Pixie very easily with this one line bash command on my cluster. And I also have the application deployed already. Um, and allow me to uh, move on to the demo. So the first thing I want to show is the uh, Kafka overview page. And uh, right. so. First, I would like to introduce a little bit about the Pixie UI. Uh, at the very top, you can select the cluster we're interested in. Uh, and here, uh, there is basically a list of um, a list of different Kafka, a list of different pixel scripts that we can select from. Um, different pixel scripts will give us different data views. Uh, and here, we can see that we have a bunch of scripts from HTTP to Kafka to MySQL. Postgres, et cetera, and also have specific scripts for specific nodes and pods. On the right side, uh, we have this uh, start time button. And now we can, uh, we're basically looking for information in the past 15 minutes. Uh, so if we hit run, uh, we actually see that in the middle of this view, we have a Kafka flow graph. Um, this basically captures the high level view of the data in our Kafka cluster right now. Uh, we see that in this flow graph, we have one topic, the order topic. 
we have one producer and two consumers. Uh, the producer is producing to the order topic at about 64 bytes per second. Um, the invoicing uh, pod is falling a little behind. Uh, it's consuming at about 33 bytes per second, whereas the shipping consumer uh, is completely normal at about 65, uh, about 64 bytes per second. So it's able to keep up with the load. And below we have a table that gives us a summary of all the Kafka topics. In this case, we only have one topic, the order topic. Um, and you know we see that it has five partitions, one active producer, two active consumers. And we also have the total number of bytes produced and total number of bytes consumed in this view as well. And all of this information uh, is being captured live with the eBPF in my cluster right now. Uh, and compiled with pixel scripts. So uh, we just noticed that the invoicing pod is uh, consuming message not as fast as we want it to be. Maybe there is something wrong with this invoicing pod. Um, and to investigate, we can actually go to uh, the Kafka stats page. And uh, in the Kafka stats, page provides us uh, some basic metrics, including the latency of our uh, Kafka messages, the request throughput, request throughput per command, et cetera. Um, it, also, it also provides us with uh, some information on the pods in our Kafka cluster, uh, including request throughput, the latency of the messages, and the total number of requests. And we can already see that the shipping pod has sent about 2,500 requests, but the invoicing requests, uh, but, but the invoicing pod have sent much less. Uh, so this is also an indication that something is wrong. We can also click here to view some specific metric uh, of the invoicing pod. So on this page, we see information like the CPU usage, uh, network traffic, network throughput, uh, disk usage, and also memory usage. If we scroll to the very bottom, we actually see that Pixie provides us a flame graph, uh, basically showing us what our CPU uh, in this cluster is currently spending time on. Uh, the, the flame graph feature currently works for C, C++, and Go, uh, and support for Java and Kafka will uh, come very soon in the future. So I will now, now like to go to the uh, uh, Kafka data view. Basically, this Kafka data table contains all the raw Kafka messages captured by eBPF in the past five minutes. Um, if we set the max num record field here, we actually um, saw that there's been 4,678 record, records produced in the past 15 minutes. Um, and for each record, we see the source and destination pod, uh, and as well as the Kafka recommend. Um, if we actually sort by time, we see that there's a whole bunch of Kafka opcodes traced by Pixie such as produce, fetch, offset commit, heartbeat, et cetera. Um, Pixie also supports full body tracing of these opcodes. Uh, if we click on this one, the produce request, for example, we can actually see that uh, Pixie parses the request body and gives us information on the name of the topic, um, what partition this is producing to, uh, and the total size of the message set. If we look at the response, we can also e see very easily if uh, there is any error coming back from the Kafka broker, uh, the base offsets, log append time, uh, et cetera. So this view is very useful if we're looking for one specific message uh, or you know, if we want to filter by a specific command. And on the right side, I would like to uh, introduce the pixel script. Um, so this is the pixel script that actually empowers this Kafka data view. Uh, 
Uh, basically, Pixel Script is Pixie's data querying language that resembles Python. It's very easy to write and allows users to apply customized transformations to their data, such as filtering or, or joining tables. Uh, if we look at this Pixel Script right here, we actually see that uh, in this line, we define a data frame uh, based on data in this uh, Kafka events table. We can add the source and destination columns here to the, to the data frame. Uh, we could also filter the data frame with uh, you know, customized source and destination filters. And we can also select at the very bottom, select the uh, columns that we want to show in this view. Yeah, so uh, this is the pixel script. Next thing I want to show that's pretty cool is the uh, Kafka producer consumer latency. Um, so this is one of a very unique feature of Pixie's Kafka tracing capability. Uh, we're able to show the, co the consumer producer latency in walk clock time. Uh, basically, this is the time between when a message is produced to when it's fetched. And if we come into this view, we enter the default namespace. Immediately, we see that uh, there's one topic called order. And if we enter the order topic here, uh, we see below we have a uh, uh, the, we have a plot showing us the delay of the producer and consumer. Um, we see that we have one producer, two consumers, and there's something really weird going on here, especially for the invoicing service. Um, filter by shipping. We can actually see that the plot looks perfectly normal. Uh, all five partitions are able to keep up with the load and latency is almost to zero the entire time. However, uh, if we go to the invoicing consumer, uh, this is very weird. We've, we can clearly see that on all five partitions, uh, latency has been creeping up you know, slowly over the time now into the 30, 35, or even 40 seconds range. Uh, and there's also a zigzag pattern uh, as latency increases. And this is because we've intentionally uh, made the invoicing service very slow so that uh, it's actually taking a very long time to process each message. So every time it grabs, uh, it consumes a bunch of messages from the Kafka broker, uh, takes an even longer time to process them. And the next time uh, it, has fallen it has fallen behind even more. And this is why there's a zigzag pattern, but the overall trend also shows that we have uh, a big issue in terms of increased latency, uh, specifically for the invoicing part. So uh, being able to measure the latency in walk clock time is very important uh, because it's very in indicative of any problem in our in a cluster. The other view I would like to show is actually the uh, um, Kafka consumer rebalancing events. So these rebalancing events happen when a new consumer comes online or an existing consumer goes offline. And the consumer in the consumer group are assigned to new partitions. Um, it's important to monitor these events because either some or all of the consumers are stopped from consuming the messages when the rebalancing is in progress. Um, it will also cause consumers to lag behind if these consumer rebalancing events are happening too often. So in the background, uh, I've just rescaled the consumers um, to trigger a rebalancing event. We can see that now we have uh, actually three shipping consumers in the shipping consumer group and uh, two invoicing consumers in the invoicing consumer group. Um, if we look at the table down below, these are the join group and sync group records collected uh, with eBPF live on my cluster. Um, and uh, each consumer rebalancing event consists of uh, one join group and one sync group request. And in the table above, we can actually visualize the delay between the join group request and the sync group request. Uh, in this case, you know, uh, it gives us information on the generation ID, the group ID, uh, and the specific member ID for each consumer in a consumer group. 
And more importantly, we can actually visualize the delay uh, in this view. So if we just look at uh, the newest uh, consumer rebalancing events, you know, we actually see that there's uh, a couple a couple ones uh, with very low delay, and the delay is the time between the joint group request and the sync group response. And uh, there's this one specifically with the invoicing pod that has shown uh, an especially high delay of 13 seconds. Uh, and this is concerning and also indi indicative of a problem uh, in the invoicing service. So to come back from the demo, um, we just saw how Pixie could work in action to debug uh, some Kafka issues. Um, to summarize, uh, it's challenging to have good visibility in the Kafka clusters because of uh, the different layers involved, from the operating system to the job, uh, to JVM to the Kafka broker itself. And there's also different components connected to the Kafka system and different clients uh, used in Kafka, such as from Java to Python to Go. And this is what makes Kafka uh, observability, visibility very challenging. And Pixie uses eBPF to automatically trace network traffic with no instrument with no instrumentation needed. Uh, Pixie requires no code modification, no redeployment, and is really easy to use. Uh, and lastly, uh, Pixie is also an open source project. So if you're interested, I would really encourage you to try it out. Um, and we always welcome feedback and contributions. So this concludes our talk. Um, thank you very much. We'll take some questions. Thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, I see there is uh, one question in Q&A. So uh, is it possible to get total number of TCP connections between a producer, a consumer, and broker cluster? Uh, could be helpful for centrally spotting heavy case streams topologies. So is it possible to get the total number of? Of TCP connections between producer slash consumer and broker cluster. If you want, if you open the QN and tab, you can see the question as well. Uh, here on open. And Anton, we cannot hear you. Sorry, game. Oh, no problem. I can, I can ask where and then Ryan can complete it, right, Ryan? Mm -hmm. um, the, the answer is yes. It's it's just possible because you have access to um, to all the TCP connections open between the brokers and the clients. Uh, the thing is how to filter that information. And right now that's a bit more challenging. But uh, modifying Pixel Script it will be uh, possible. So you can, for example, select a specific uh, consumer. And because it access to the internal Kafka protocol, uh, it can filter those consumers and, and map them to specific TCP connections. So it should be uh, possible, uh, but it's not provided right now out of the box, as far as I know, by uh, by Pixie. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't yeah. have a view for uh, explicitly, you know, seeing the total number of TCP connections, but it is it is definitely possible with Pixel scripts. And what tooling and frameworks are we are you using to define BPF probes? We use uh, BCC. Okay, great. Thank you for your answers. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, it seems no questions are coming. So uh, if you would like to discuss further, yeah, you can move on to, to Discord, or uh, you can uh, use also uh, the virtual platform work adventure. Uh, so feel free to go there and uh, you can uh, discuss uh, the related topics or anything else. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, that's all for now uh, from my side for you, the speaker. Thank you very much.